Last year during Disciple Now, we answered three of the biggest questions that anyone could possibly ask. Why are we here? What went wrong? And why did Jesus come? For something to come from nothing is a scientific impossibility. And therefore, we are here because God created us. Just as every building has a builder and every piece of art as an artist, the design and complexity of the universe, from the largest galaxy to a single microscopic cell in your body, all of it proves that there is a creator. This God who created us is good. And his creation was good too. But obviously, something has gone wrong. What happened? Well, God wants you and I to love him. But true love is a choice, meaning that you and I can choose not to love God. To not love the God who gave us life and every good thing that we have would be a very foolish choice, but it is a choice we can and do make. This is called sin. And sinning in a universe created by God is going to mess things up. And that is exactly what has happened. The reason why this world is so full of pain, the reason why this world is so full of suffering, the reason why this world is so full of death is all because of sin. And it's not God's fault. None of it is God's fault. It's all our fault. And no amount of good works can make up for the bad things that we've done. But this is why Jesus came. God became a man named Jesus Christ to do what no other human being could do, live a perfect life free from sin. And Jesus never sinned. Because he sinned, he didn't have to die, but he chose to die in order to take our punishment. Jesus then came back to life three days later in order to defeat death. And the Bible says that if you repent, if you turn away from your sins and trust in Jesus, make him number one in your life, you will be both forgiven and given the hope of everlasting life in paradise. Forty days after Coming back to life, Jesus flew back up into heaven, but he promised to return one day to fix everything that our sin has ruined. This is the good news of the gospel. And today, you and I live in the gap between the first and second comings of Jesus Christ. In the meantime, those of us who have already made a decision to follow Jesus, we have the comfort of knowing that he is always with us in spirit, no matter what. We also have his word, the Bible, to lead, guide, and direct us. Unfortunately, most of this world remains content to do things selfishly their own way instead of God's way. In fact, you could say that this world is like a strong river raging against the things of God. And it's very easy for you and I to just go along with it. However, this river of the world is racing towards a fall that will destroy it all. God, though, is calling you and I to fight against this current and go upstream. Indeed, upstream is the theme for Disciple Now this year. Will you choose Christ-centered living? in a self-centered world. It's something that's easier said than done. But during our time together, we're going to look at some people who paddled upstream against the world. And as we do so, the goal is to not only learn from their examples, but be encouraged by them. Some of these people lived between when God created the universe and when Jesus came back the first time. And not long after God created humanity, Genesis 6, 5 through 8 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, 
both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible goes on to tell us that God judged the sin of the world at that time with a global flood. Indeed, the destructive nature of that judgment is still seen today. And all the many rock layers laid down by water filled with fossils of dead things. Yet Hebrews 11.7 says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Because of his faith, Noah, his family, and at least two of every kind of air-breathing, land-dwelling animal was saved on a huge ship called an ark. And herein lies the first key to swimming upstream against the culture. You have to have faith in God. You have to have faith in God. If you don't have faith like Noah to start with, you're down. How many of you have ever been told, be good for goodness sake? I think probably all of us have. It's actually terrible advice, though. I've worked with youth for a very long time, and one of the things I've seen over and over and over again is kids being good just because their parents or a teacher or some other adult is watching. And yet as soon as the adults aren't looking, that person becomes a hellion. It gets even worse after going to college. Students who got character awards in high school because they were perfect little angels around the adults go off to college and they make pretty much every bad decision possible. That's what being good, for goodness sake, does. It doesn't create any true character at all. You can't go upstream against the culture that way. It's not possible. It's like taking one paddle forward when a raging river is taking you several paddles closer to a waterfall that will kill you on the rocks below. However, if loving God compels you to do what's right even when no one is looking if the love of God compels you to do what's right even if it's hard with God's help you can overcome the current trends of this world just as Noah survived the flood faith is the first key to swimming upstream in a self-centered world now you would think the flood of Noah's day and the evidence of it we still have in the ground would remind us of both God's judgment and his great grace to save. But sadly, these reminders were quickly forgotten and today falsely attributed to the unscientific theory of evolution. Instead of spreading out to fill the earth, all of Noah's descendants or all of humanity gathered together in one place to build a city and a tower called Babel or Babylon in modern Iraq. God judges humanity's sin once again, but this time with the milder judgment of confusing our languages. This causes humanity to spread out all over the earth, to fill it as God intended, but the nations and cultures that arise all over the world choose to do things selfishly their own way instead of God's way. However, God in His grace still has a plan to save humanity. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 says this. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The nation that will come from Abram or Abraham is Israel. 
and the way that Israel will bless all the families of the earth, the way that Israel will bless all the nations of the world, is through Jesus. And the land that God gave Israel is the most important strip of land on the planet. It is a small strip connect, connecting three of our major continents, Europe, Africa, and Asia. And God did this on purpose so that the good news of his grace would most easily spread all over the world. However, a sin-cursed world still presents challenges. The promised land can be subject to drought and famines. And this causes the Israelites to go to Egypt when they run out of food. And while in Egypt, the Israelites become enslaved until God sends Moses to lead them out through many mighty miracles. The goal? Get back to the promised land. And this takes us to our next two examples of faith. Joshua and Caleb. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 1 through 20 to start with. Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 through 20. Please rise with me as we read God's holy, authoritative, inspired, and inerrant or without error word. Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 through 20. This is what it says. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the children of Israel. Now these were their names, from the tribe of Reuben, Shemua, the son of Zakur. From the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Bori. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. From the tribe of Issachar, Egal, the son of Joseph. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu. From the tribe of Zebulun, Gediel, the son of Sodi. From the tribe of Joseph, that is from the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi. From the tribe of Dan, Amamiel, the son of Gamali. From the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael. From the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Vophsi. From the tribe of Gad, Geuel, the son of Machi. These are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains. And see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are forests there or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. The nation of Israel has 12 tribes, and one leader from each of these tribes was chosen to go and spy out or scout out the promised land. Caleb was chosen from the tribe of Judah, and Joshua was chosen from the tribe of Ephraim. Their mission includes the following. God had warned them ahead of time that there were ungodly people living in the promised land. But Israel wanted to know some things about these enemies. Were they strong or weak? Were they few or many? Were their settlements camps or strongholds? Furthermore, when the Israelites left the promised land hundreds of years earlier, it was very poor with no food. Had the land recovered? Was it good or bad? Was it rich with an abundance of food to support them? These were the questions Moses and the Israelites had. Now we too should ask questions when it comes to 
evaluating our current cultural situation. Say you're invited to a party. That happens. Y'all are in middle school and high school. When you're invited to a party, ask yourself some questions first before you go. What kind of people are going to be there? What kind of supervision will there be? What kind of a party is it? Asking and answering such questions beforehand is wise and can save you a lot of trouble in the end. Let's continue forward in our text. Let's look at Numbers 13, 21 through 33. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron. Ahiman, Shishay, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and there cut a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there, and they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron, all the congregation of the children of Israel, in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. You know, asking and answering questions is one thing. Responding wisely according to God's word? That's quite another. The twelve spies of Israel found the land God promised to them had recovered quite nicely to flow with milk and honey. But evil people inhabiting the land lived in cities that were walled. They were heavily fortified. And furthermore, the people themselves were both numerous in terms of of number and in size or height. Some of these people were actually the ancestors of the infamous Goliath who will fight David many years from this point. Now some of you might be thinking, Pastor Keith, are you telling me that giants are real? I, I thought they were just fairy tales. Well, it's just like the rock layers and fossils I mentioned earlier. Are they from Noah's flood or from millions of years of evolution? Everyone has the same evidence. The question is, how do you look at the evidence? How do you interpret it? Who do you believe? Do you believe the God who knows everything and has always been around? Or do you believe people who don't know everything and haven't always been around? I mentioned this on a Wednesday night a couple weeks ago, but I'll say it again. Archaeologists have found giant spearheads in the promised land, far larger than spearheads a typical human being is capable of using. Now those who don't believe in God or his word say that these spearheads are merely decorative or ceremonial because no normal human being could reliably wield such things in a battle. 
However, these giant spearheads were chipped. They're cracked in places, showing signs of use prior to their discovery. And that being the case, the ceremonial or decorative explanation doesn't match the evidence as well as God's word does. And so, who do you trust? Who influences you the most? God or men? God or Instagram? God or TikTok? Who influences you the most? Who should influence you the most? Let's continue looking at our text. Numbers 14, 1 through 10. So all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Should it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. So, ten of Israel's spies do not think Israel is capable of retaking the promised land given the strength and size of its inhabitants. However, Joshua and Caleb believe that with the Lord's help, they can do it. Moses and his brother Aaron agree with Joshua and Caleb, but the rest of the Israelites agree with the other ten spies, seek another leader to take them back to Egypt, and they threaten to stone Joshua and Caleb with stones to the death. This gives us another lesson when it comes to going upstream against the culture. Don't be surprised if it gets difficult. Don't be surprised if it gets costly. I'll return to the party situation I mentioned earlier. When I was in high school, I was, and my friends also were, invited to a birthday party. And uh, we decided to go, got permission from my parents to go. And I didn't know exactly where the party was. Uh, one of my friends did, so I just uh, drove my car to his house and then he took me in his car to the house where the party was. And, you know, maybe I was just young and naive, but I had no idea that anything bad could happen. Well, things started off innocently enough with pizza and cake, but I was a little surprised to see no parents around. But before I knew it, someone had put on a pornographic movie, a, a, a literally X-rated movie. And uh, I knew from God's word, it is not right for me to watch this. And so uh, I, I pleaded with them to shut it off. They would not listen. They were nagging me to watch this pornographic movie with them. And so finally I just decided I'm going outside. I'm going outside. I'm getting away from this. Couldn't drive home. I didn't have my car. So I just went outside. Now you might think, okay, you went outside. No big deal. Well kind of was a big deal because it was the middle of winter time in Wisconsin 
and uh, let's just say uh, I did not plan on being outside very long, and so uh, I had not dressed appropriately. I had not brought the right gear. And so I went outside and I started freezing very quickly. Well, um, I wasn't outside uh, too long and then one of my other friends uh, came outside and uh, we were miserable together. You know, they say that misery loves company, it's, it's true. Uh, so we were uh, outside freezing to death together, uh, but we appreciated the company and uh, uh, finally, the, the movie ended and my other friend took me back home and I never went back to that house again. But I share all of this not for my own sake, but for yours. Going upstream against the world by standing for God can be difficult. It can cost you something, but it's worth it. It's always worth it in the end. We'll see that here in Numbers 14, 11 through 38. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make you a nation greater and mightier than they. And Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear it. For by your might you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among these people, and that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands above them. And you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day, and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak saying because the Lord was not able to was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to give them therefore he killed them in the wilderness and now I pray let the power of my Lord be great just as you have spoken saying the Lord is long suffering and abundant in mercy forgiving iniquity and transgression but he by no means clears the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt of, until now. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. But truly, as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness... And have put me to the test now these ten times, and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of these who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him, and has followed me fully, I will bring into, into the land that he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your sons will be shepherds in the wilderness for forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years, and you shall know my rejection. I, the Lord, have spoken this, 
I will surely do to all this evil generation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Now the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation complain against him by bringing a bad report of the land, those very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh remained alive of the men who went out to spy out the land. As costly as it is, going against the flow of the world. It is nothing compared to both the punishment that awaits those who do not believe, as well as the blessings that believers will get in the future. The 10 spies who didn't believe in God all immediately died from a plague. Furthermore, all the Israelites 20 years old and up who trusted those bad spies over God they're forced to live in the wilderness for 40 years until they all die too. But because Joshua and Caleb believed in the Lord, because they trusted in the Lord, God says that they will still be allowed to enter into and live in the promised land. In fact, I want to read you one more passage. It's from Joshua 14, 6-15. It says, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these forty-five years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am this day, 85 years old. Yet, I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. And just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him, and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba, Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. Because Caleb believed in God, because Caleb trusted in God, he, as an 85-year-old, is blessed with the strength of a 40-year-old. I've seen something close. In my previous church, when I was 27 years old, I had a 70-year-old deacon, great man of God. One time during a church work day, we had to break up a section of concrete sidewalk with sledgehammers. I'm embarrassed to say I got tired faster than he did. But I'm never surprised when God blesses people who walk with him. It may not be in a monetary way, but such people are blessed. And so as we bring this session to a close, I ask you, do you know that God is with you and that he's blessing you when you seek to love him and live for him?
don't be afraid to go upstream. Have faith in God. Live that faith out. And you will be absolutely amazed.